So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jörg. Um, so I'd like to just open the floor up to, uh, to a couple of people. Um, I've had Yaku ask a question. Yaku, if you can unmute yourself and, and ask um, Jürgen a question, your question. Hi, Jürgen. I hope you're doing really well. Thank you so much for your um, for the presentation. Um, I do have a question. Um, so I specifically am in a, a marketing field. You didn't mention anything relating to reducing necessarily your marketing spend. Uh, do you mind um, mentioning where that would fall within those reduced costs um, line of events before laying people off or between extending payable uh, payments terms and accounts payable? I mean, basically, you know, if, if when you go back to cash is king, reduce expenditures, okay? Expenditure means any cash out in your organization, whether it's marketing money, whether it's travel, whether it's uh, 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 capital expenditure. So for me, you know, being in the marketing field for quite a number of years in my life, that's normally the first thing you do, okay? And I mean, to give an example, in Switzerland, just yesterday, two uh, weekly, no, two monthly magazine, you know, business magazine had to go, had to give up because nobody was, is advertising anymore for the time being, okay? So, and normally advertising or, or, or uh, you know, is, is normally something very important which you can reduce immediately and fast. And if you do that only for six months or for 12 months, then you normally don't hurt your brand, okay? Mm. Or you might be selective on what you advertise, you know? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. I um, also saw a question coming up from uh, Peter Scott. Yeah, Brendan, sorry. I mean, I, uh, here, um, good morning. Thank you so much for that. I mean, I think I just want to respond to the point that Yako made uh, regarding marketing and the comment I've just typed in there, Yako, is Jörg's absolutely correct about focusing on the cash flow. My, my only additional comment to that is, you know, it, Now's the time for, for business owners to be very careful, be very aware of what the marketing numbers are telling them. All right, so you've got to know your numbers. In Action Coach, we talk about the five ways numbers. You've got to know your numbers in order for you to make an informed decision about which marketing to cut. And I think what, what Jörg's also aligning to is the fact that you've got to say, if you stop marketing in entirety, you're going to have a cash flow problem six months down the road. And to rather align your marketing efforts to something that's going to give you short-term returns. The big message that Jörg is getting to everybody is around all your activities and all your expenditure, all your priorities got to be around short-term short -term, um, returns. And that's my only comment I'd make to you on top of the, the comments that Jörg has made. Jörg, I don't know whether you've got a comment on that. No, no, that's, that's a fault. I mean, I, you, I fully agree. I think you should not even think about 2021 second yeah. half. You should think about the, until the end of the year and maybe the first half of, of next year because um, depending on what type of business you're in, okay? I mean, uh, if, you know, if, if you are in a company which produces like pipes where you have three months put through and you have to yeah. buy material, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're working on a backlog. If you're in a service company, then you, then you don't work with a backlog. You, you work every day, so to speak. Then I think any, everything you do is, must be on your head. Does this generate cash short term, period? Short term. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for the for the talk. Um, I just coming back to what Yaku was saying. I think it's uh, and also what Peter said. You know, if you if you're investing in marketing, it potentially could generate some short term cash. And I, I know businesses very well. Uh, Yaku's business, sorry, very well. And what he does, Peter, is he's he drills down into the numbers. He's got a great business. 
will actually tell you, um, you know, more, more succinctly than, than you normally probably look at how well your business's um, marketing spend is working on his uh, Google ads. So I think it's, it's a sort of debatable question in my opinion. Um, it's not, it's not as clear cut as just cut it completely. If you're looking at it from a cash generation point of view, that's just my view. Yeah, I think, I think Nigel, thanks for that. <clears throat> my comment is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, you. Paul, I, I see need... from you, Vita, I see that you have uh, your, your hand raised. So I think Peter was responding to Nigel quickly. I'll let him finish quickly. Sorry about that, uh, Brendan. Yeah, look, if I if I purported to say that you know cut marketing, I don't think that that's what I'm saying, and I don't think that that's what Jörg's saying. And I and I think the only thing is, and I understand your business, Jörg, but I'm talking to the rest of the delegates in the group as well. It's about focusing your marketing activity for short term gain. Don't get into long term marketing investments right now. That's the key message that Jörg's sending to everybody today. And to know your numbers, to know your numbers like you do, Yoko, in your business, but the rest of the business owners and the rest of us is to make absolutely sure that we know the numbers so you can make the right investment decision. Yeah, yeah. So and, and that's the service that uh, he, he assists people knowing the numbers. So just punting his business for a few guys there. <laughs> You know, to say it a bit simple, you have to run the, your business right now on a cash basis and not on a profit basis, to be very clear. Okay. Yeah. Now you can obviously, you have exceptions. To, to give an example, the stronger a brand is, the, le the more time or the more, let's say, time you can take out to reduce your marketing expenditure short term, okay? I mean, Rolex, to give you an example, they can take marketing for six months out, nothing happens, okay? Because Rolex is such a strong brand, people will not forget about, it, okay? Now, Rolex is a, is, a, is a bad example because they are so big, but, you know, we, I mean, they, they can also afford it. They don't have that situation that they are running out of cash, but, uh, uh, I mean, I made this example, which we made uh, to close an office in, in Dubai because we just can't afford or we don't want to afford. It's not a question of not can. It's we don't want to afford it right now. And we want to put that 1 million euro on the side uh, for more productive, more short term oriented uh, uh, benefits, you know. So Brendan, can I go ahead? My, my question relates to your first slide. I think it was the cash is king where you said reduce working time without compensation and the salaries and so on. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, we have a lot of laws that, that are, are guiding uh, labor and so on. In your opinion, how would one change the mindset of people? Because obviously, in theory, we know it's better to have a job with 10% um, or 20% of your salary compared to no job at all. How would you respond to business? I, I don't have a large organization, but I work with businesses that have large staff and that, that whole fight with the unions in terms of, you know, let's, let's put people on short timing or furlough. Or, and and then how do you change the mindset of the people arguing for that? Because I think that's one of the challenges that a lot of business owners, owners have okay. just dealing with it. Okay. Okay. I, I think, you know, the, the first uh, statement for me is obviously if you treat it, your, your people in the past fairly and reasonable, they are probably more willing, so to speak, to help you out in this difficult situation, okay? And, but my experience is very clear that you have basically have to tell them very clear that you as a company, as an organization, will adhere to the let's say the legal requirements which are available. That's for me given, but you can then go out and say our circumstances right now, short term are not allowing us if we only adhere to these, let's say legal requirements, we need more, okay? We either need more, I can cut the people 
by 30% to get the cost reduction. I can keep you for six months, but you work only a certain period of time and no expense. Or if you, if you, if you, uh, if you work uh, a reduced time after six months, if we have cash again, I will reimburse 50% of what you have, so to speak, been able to reduce. I think for me, it's a combination of different things you need to do. But the first step is you have to tell them very clearly that you adhere to the legal requirements. But the legal requirement is not good enough to make the company survive, okay? So you guys have a, a, an opportunity. We can fight the survival together, okay? And then you might get a benefit six months, 12 years down the road. When I get, when the company has some cash, I reimburse you with a delay 50% of what I'm asking for you as, as an addition, or uh, I, I even give you 100% back too, you know, so so for me, you know best what is the, uh, the the right way for your organization. But normally, my experience, it's a combination of different things. It's not just one. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. I understand where Paul's coming from because as a labor attorney, I can tell you and having dealt with a lot of uh, trade unions in, in, in our country, um, despite the legal constraints under which we find ourselves often in terms of the, the suggestions that you've made in, the, in terms of reduction of salaries, um, reduction of staff, reduction of working time, Apart from the fact that we are compelled to comply with our legal requirements, unfortunately, the mindset with most employees in most businesses is that um, money is key. For them, for a business, cash is king, but for a staff member, they're not willing to, to, to be game players. They're not willing to lose an income or have their income reduced and the ability to understand the business principles is, 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 is in itself a challenge. Trying to get them to understand why you need to reduce stock, why you need to reduce salaries. They don't often understand that. Unfortunately, um, you know, you, you're dealing with lay people at the end of the day and even with trade unions, many of them lack the formal qualifications to truly understand what it is that we're trying to advise them on. So you, you've got this constant struggle between what the law requires us to do versus trying to convince them of what is best for the organization. They don't see it as it being best for the organization. They see it as the, 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 the management team wanting to keep their salaries, wanting to stay in their positions. They're not willing to take a cut and it's the people at the bottom who are suffering. They see it as a form of suffering. They don't see it as, listen, this is short term, but we're trying to save this business. And in order to save the business, this is what we need to do. Because if we don't save the business, everyone loses a job, not just the five that we've chosen or whatever the case may be. So how do we go about working with that? The, 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 the legal constraints versus this mindset issue that we, we're dealing with. Try and negotiate with one of our trade unions in this country, sir. I promise you, you'll want to pull your hair out by the end of the day. They just don't get it. Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. I think uh, Peter Skoltz had a, had a comment on that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether Hans wants to comment on that, Wendy. Um, and maybe this is subject to another discussion. Uh, let me just let me just add. Being there, done that, worked through this process from the mid 80s. What we're seeing in South Africa at the moment is petty cash and small fry to what we would, went through in the 1980s. Um, two things I want to add on to Hans's comment. 
it is a multiple number of factors that will get you to the culture where people buy into what you're trying to do as an individual. And I'm talking about a personal experience here. Number one is I have a view that a lot of the labor problems we've got in South Africa are as a result of a lack of leadership in organizations. Now, leadership, to Hans's one point early on, sometimes requires tough decisions. All right, so that's the first comment I want to make to you. Secondly, I want to make the other comment to everybody that if you think the South African labor legislation is as difficult as it is, then you need to go to some of the European countries to understand how difficult their labor legislation is. And all our labor legislation requires us to do is to treat people fairly. Now, I want to go to another comment around how do you negotiate that? There's a very good book that I read in the early 80s. Uh, Hans uh, probably read it uh, called Maverick and on page 18 of the book it talks about the following it says you cannot expect a spirit of solidarity to happen in an organization <clears throat> if you're not when, when times are tough if you're not sharing in the spoils when times are good and so I've been in situations and worked in large multinational corporations where we've been able to reduce salaries. We've been able to, in actual fact, ask for commitment as a result, as opposed to laying off and retrenchments with, with organizations. They require tough decisions, tough discussions with trade unions, which comes back to my point around oftentimes, and I'm critical of this in, 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 in businesses in South Africa, we lack leadership in business in South Africa. We, we back off too quickly, all right? And, and so, if you give people an understanding of what's going on, et cetera, that's fine. In, in my, some of my top negotiations with Kosati in the early 80s, somebody made a comment to me one day and said, um, it is ironic that you only prepare to share um, with us the financials of the organization when things are going bad. Therefore, we don't trust you. So you share with us when things are going bad, the financials, but when things are going good, you still want to cut costs. And that got me to, to a point where in the businesses I've worked in before, we have shared every single month full financial disclosure to all the employees. So that comes about that transparent leadership point that Hans was talking about early on. Full financial disclosure of what's happening in the business every single month, even when it's going well. Because you cannot expect a spirit of solidarity from people when things are going tough, if you haven't shared with them what's going on when things are going well. Does that make sense? I've, I can talk about that for a long time, but that's the summary of really just the commentary I want to make. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, I saw that uh, Paul had his hand up and so did Jaka. Let's start with Paul. That's fine. Sorry, I'll take it down. The uh, question was asked, uh, answered. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Jaku. You're still on mute. Thanks, Brendan. Um, Mr. Shah, I have another question for you. Yeah. Um, now, in, in our, our current situation is, um, our business is profitable at the moment and, and quite well. We've had a, a U-shaped recovery. We, we did take a knock, but we've recovered well and we are on a, on a good trend. Um, now, we are actually in the process of, of hiring individuals, but is that a good decision to make? You say that every decision you make, um, does this generate cash in the short term? And cash is king. Keeping cash now is a good decision to have. So would it be a bad decision now to start hiring individuals in a market that is not favorable for business in general? No, I think, I think, uh, uh, I think you know, selective. You know, I mean, even if you have a headcount reduction overall, you can still be in, 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 in a situation where selectively, you might have to hire people because you, you want to change. I mean, for me, headcount reduction doesn't mean that you don't hire selective different expertise, okay? Because you might, to make an example, you might have to fire workers because you, don't, you have too much capacity, to say it simple, or administrative stuff but you might have to hire your sales guys because you need to, to, to cover new customers on new territories. So for me, headcount reduction means that in total, as an organization, you might have 100 employees, you cut 25 to 75, 
but your objective is to be at 80. So you hire five new, but the five new have an expertise which you did not have before. Okay. Mm. So, you know, so I think, you know, the, the, the business is not as black and white as, 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 as people normally think about. Okay. Headcount reduction means an objective of where I want to get to. But this is a plus and minus level, okay? And the second one, which I think I want to say to Wendy, when you have discussions, you obviously have different type of discussions with different types of peoples. I mean, union, nice people, you talk differently to than professional people or management people. So, so from that point of view, you cannot talk to everybody the same, okay? You know, you, and you cannot ask from everybody the same. But if somebody is a top a management part of the management team and he does not want to take 20% cut because of the situation, that person is gone tomorrow with me. I tell you, he's gone, okay? Whereas if the worker would not accept 20% cut, then I have to accept it, okay? But I think what Peter said is very clear, is very good. Then it's tough times. If you don't treat the guys before in the good times in a reasonable manner, don't ask in the tough times for some volunteer reductions. It's a no. So it's always a two-way street, okay? Great. Um, I was just looking, I saw, Kenny, did you have a question? Yeah, so mine goes around, and I, and I have to type it into the box for everybody to have a look at around, and I think it's a balance, you know, just listening where the conversation's going. It's a balance about your leadership and your leadership style, because, yes, the numbers are important, but if you treat the people badly, you lose the team, therefore you can't make the numbers. If you uh, yeah. treat the people too well, then they get too comfortable, therefore the numbers will suffer and you will also then end up going bankrupt. So it's about balancing and about adjusting yourself as a leader at the right time, exactly when you need to focus on the right things. And like you said earlier on, you've got to focus on what really matters right now. Other stuff, you leave it. Focus on balancing, keeping your team, keeping your people, because without your team and your people, you can't succeed. And jump in as the leader and and do the bits that they see. You're also prepared to do it. And I think that's the big thing that everybody needs to focus on. So if you need to go and cut your salary, or if you need to work longer hours so that others can work shorter hours, etc., you've got to do that as a leader and really jump in and do it. So yeah. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Kenny. Um, Nigel has a question. I see Bernie just had his hand up. Maybe you just want to ask him. Sure. Uh, Bernie? Um, I'm just fascinated. I mean, obviously, I have the greatest respect for Jürgen, the kind of position that he's held with such major companies. And I'm fascinated with leadership. I'd just like to ask a personal question. Is what do you think is the most difficult uh, leadership um, decision that you've ever had to make? You know, to, 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 to close factories is always something not very, not very positive, okay? Uh, it's always easier to hire people and uh, then to fire people. And uh, I think, but that's, as the higher you get in an organization, the more uh, uh, you have to be able to do both. And you have to do both in a very, what I would call, positive way. You know, to close a factory, you also have to be fair, okay? And or if you if you if you uh, if you have to fire somebody who has worked with you for twenty or thirty year, or I had at one time in a company, we had we had to reduce capacity, so I had to go. Uh, and, you know, in Switzerland, you go in pension scheme when you are sixty five. And uh, so I had to go and get pe uh, about rid of about 90 people, uh, which were between 60 and 65. And that was pretty tough too, because uh, everybody had its own 
situation, person, personal situation. But uh, uh, you know, that's what you got. That's what you have to deal with. Okay. Thank and you. Fairness, fairness in how you treat people is very important in the good times as well as in the bad times. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, can I hand back to to you, Nigel? Thanks, Brendan. Uh, you, you were just talking about uh, not developing new markets, um, but you know we've we've uh, got a very weak currency at the moment, and it probably looks like it's going to continue that way. Um, we have a lot of talented people uh, working on social media, graphic design, etc., who can provide services into into Europe, US, etc., on an online basis. Do you not think this is a good opportunity for um, people in, in those sort of areas to exploit these markets? Sure. I mean, I, th I think, you know, to, a, a service business is always easier, so to speak, to manage and normally needs less investment beside the human investment because the, the human investment is like, it's also from a cost point of view, it, it's the major element. But I think uh, my message is you should never take a no for a no. You should always think positive and, and, and even in difficult times, try anything. I mean, my experience is if, 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 if you think people will not be ready to do that, you will be surprised uh, sometimes how positive they answer to your request. And, and, and the same is on opportunities for new businesses. I mean, just don't give up. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, thanks. Yeah, I think uh, for a lot of business owners at the moment, it's, uh, it's a case of that they could be ready to, to throw in the towel and um, to find out that there's a way um, around these challenges that we have at the moment is, is key. Okay. Um, Peter, I see you have a, another comment in. Would you like to... Brendan, i like to add something on this, okay? Sure. I think what is important since, since you guys, a lot of you work in smaller businesses. So, so you as the owner or the manager or the leader, sometimes you feel lonely, okay? And so, so basically I think what is important and I think that would be hopefully a good sign that you need somebody like a sounding board you can talk to about your problems and what you like to do to get another opinion. In big corporations, normally that's the CEO talks to the, the chairman of the board, okay? And so, and I think here in, in your organization where you are small the tight businesses, that's where, in my opinion, the action coach, so to speak, could fill in to be the sounding board if, if, if before you, if you have a problem and you need somebody to talk to, you know, before you make a decision. Uh, Jörg, I think that's one of our, our functions as, as coaches. We're the, we're the sounding board for, for just about everybody on you. Um, you know, there's one or two clients that are probably thinking to themselves right now, yeah, I bounced something off uh, one of our coaches during the last week. Um, I've had, a, I've had a, a, a CEO speak to me the other day and he said to me, you know, I haven't had a boss to, to answer to for the last 15 years. Um, and it's quite nice to have somebody that's uh, breathing down my neck, uh, making sure that I'm delivering results and it's not the other way around for once, which for me was, uh, which was quite nice for me, actually. Um, Peter, you were going to say something just now? Yeah, I think, Brendan, just coming back to this, the concept of reducing headcount and having to lay off people, and as Jürg has mentioned early on, that's always got to be your last decision, and you've got to look at every other avenue before you have to go down that route. One of the ways that I found it makes it easier, because I don't think anybody enjoys doing it, but if you have to reduce headcount by 10 people, remember you doing that in order to save the 60 who are still going to be employed. So that gets your focus away from the pain of having to reduce headcount with 10 people, but you're doing that in order to save 60. That's the first quick comment I wanna make. The second comment is, 
when you do the retrenchment process and it comes back to some of the legal process, it comes back to leadership and culture, is I've always said to myself that the way I treat people during the retrenchment is as important for them as it is for the people who are staying behind. Because we tend to forget about these people who are staying behind and the people who are staying in the organization are watching you as a leader and saying, how are you treating people who are being retrenched? is going to be indicative of what you're going to do to me maybe in two, three years time when I have to be retrenched. So focus on the way you do your retrenchment that is fair, that is displays who you are as a leader. As important as it is to have that individual leading the organization, that's critical. But for the people who are staying behind that still have to be committed and productive and committed to your leadership style, important, very important to focus on those people who are staying behind as well. Great. That's uh, really valid. Thanks, Peter. Um, are there any other questions for, for Jörg before we let him go? Great. So, Jörg, do you have any uh, parting shots for us or any? Uh... Well, I think, I, think uh, I uh, hopefully I gave you some ideas what you could do. And I think every one of you has to work on his situation and uh, try to make uh, the uh, right decision and not only make the decision but execute according